We begin with Allah's blessed name. We praise Him and we glorify Him as He ought to be praised and glorified. And we pray for peace and for blessings on all of His noble messengers and in particular on the last of them all. The blessed Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa We thank Him. We thank Him who has made it possible for this second international Islamic retreat to be held here on the soil of Africa. In South, Southern Africa, in Cape Town, here close to Simon's Town. The month of Rabi Thani in the year 1432 of the Hijra. It's almost completed. No, half of it is already done. And uh, we attempt now to begin our teaching in this seminar, in this uh, retreat, to attempt to explain the subject of the link between Islamic spirituality and the subject of the end times. We live in a world which is constantly changing. But the Prophet ﷺ spoke about a certain period in the historical process which would be different from everything else which preceded it. He called it the age of fitan, the age of tests and trials. And our effort tonight is to try to explain the link that exists between <coughs> Islamic spirituality, which we'll have to define, and the study of the subject of the age of Fitan, or the end times. When we have done that, we would have begun the process of understanding the world today, and would have equipped ourselves with a capacity to respond to the world today appropriately. What is Islamic spirituality? And how is it linked with the end time? The Prophet ﷺ had performed the Hajj. And he left Mecca and returned to Medina. <coughs> After the Khutbatul Wida, or the farewell sermon at the end of the Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent down revelation with which you are all familiar. That this day the religion is perfected. al akmaltu lakum deenakum. This day the job is completed. Wa'admamtu alaykum ni'mati. And so we thought that this is the end of revelation. Everything is perfect. <coughs> Everything is complete. But no, there is something more. He returns to Medina, sallallahu alaihi wasallam. And there are now about eighty-one days left in his blessed life before he's called away from this world. Why? We ask. Why? Should one more revelation come in Medina at this time? A revelation on riba. And it's the last revelation, because it came after Khutbatul Wida. 
on the authority of Abdullah ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala anhumah and recorded in the Sahih of Imam al-Bukhari. This is the last revelation. So it has to come after <coughs> Khutbatul Wida. It is in Medina. And it is on river. And Allah declares war. War. فَأَذَنُوا بِحَرْبِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ on those who are still demanding the riba. If Allah is at war, and if his messenger is at war, then we are also at war. So when a world is saturated with riba, as it is today, we go back home and we have biryani for dinner and we go to sleep. It does not impress the one who created us from a drop of sperm. We must ask ourselves why did he send down this as the last revelation, but that's not for tonight. Something else happened in Medina before he died. And we know it occurred in Medina because of the answer to a question. We were sitting in the masjid and the messenger of Allah sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam was sitting with us. When this extraordinary event occurred with which you are all familiar. So I can speed up a little bit. The stranger entered. No one knew him. So he's not a resident. But there is no sign of travel on him. So he's not a foreigner. He's not a traveler. So well, if he's not a resident, and if he's not a traveler, did he drop out of the sky? This is not by accident. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is arresting us to provoke us to think. He sent the Quran liqawmi yatafakkaroon for a people who will think the fala yatadabbaroon al-Quran will they not ponder, reflect, think. And this also provokes thought. The stranger walks through the gathering and a significant breach of security occurs because he could be the enemy. And he goes directly in front of the Prophet Islam, so close that if he wanted to attack, none of us could intervene. <laughs> How do we explain that none of us move to stop the man? And then he proceeds to ask questions and the Prophet ﷺ submitted to the questioning. But every time he would answer, the man would say, your answer is correct. And for us, this is not respectful. Because we would only ask a question when we do not know the answer. But you should be asking the messenger of Allah a question when you already know the answer. And then when he answers and he says, this is the answer, you should then say to him, the answer is correct. We are being arrested so that we would be provoked into thinking. And then when the five questions were over. The man got up and left as mysteriously as he had come. <coughs> and no one said a word. And then the messenger of Allah asked, Do you know who he was? And we said, Allah, his messenger, no best. We don't. That was Jibra'il. He came to instruct you in your deen. Allah sent him. 
Allah did not send him by accident, but by design. A profound moment, an unforgettable moment, with a message never to be forgotten. And all of this we have said in order to impress upon this gathering the supreme importance of what occurred in this event. What occurred? What occurred in this event gives us the link between what we call Islamic spirituality, others may call it, call it something else, we call Islamic spirituality and the subject of Alamatu Sa'ah, the end times. It's here. What is Islam? And in the answer he mentions that Islam includes amongst the five is the Hajj. But he could only have said that after the Hajj was performed. Prior to that Hajj being performed, it was not a part of the five pillars of Islam. This is why we know that this event took place after he returned to Medina. And what is Iman? And he gives the answer that Iman is that you must have Iman. And then he enumerates all the requirements of Iman. But the Quran has already told us that Iman is something that enters into the heart. That you declare the faith but only when you live the faith and it enters into the heart, then only you have Iman. So Iman is that you must have Iman in Allah. Iman is that you must have Iman in the Prophets, etc. It must enter into the heart. But when it enters into the heart, then something becomes possible. And that is stage three. And that is Al Ihsan. And that is Islamic spirituality. What is Al Ihsan? And he replied that you should worship Allah as though you're seeing Him. That you should serve Allah as though you're seeing Him. And ta'bud Allah ka but then when Musa alayhi salam went up the mountain and asked, Arini, Anzur ilayk. Show me yourself. I want to see you. Allah says, Lan tarani. You can never see me. So what does it mean that we should worship Allah as we are seeing Him when we can never see Him? Oh, but the companions ask, O oh, Messenger of Allah, would we be able to see Allah on Judgment Day? And both the Quran replied and the Prophet replied that on that day you'll be looking at him. He said that you, you have no difficulties, do you, in seeing the sun when it is? Noon time? We said no. Do you have any difficulties in seeing, seeing the moon when it is full moon? They said no. But that's how you'll see your Lord on Judgment Day. And the Quran confirmed that. Oh! But over there we are told you can never see him. And over here we are told you can see him. Is this a contradiction? No, there are no contradictions in the Qur'an. Well then, how do we explain this? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives us the explanation. And this is what the brother from Mombasa, I believe, was speaking about in the tent. أَفَلَمْ يَسِيرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ Will they not travel to the earth? Will they not travel to the earth? And when you travel to the earth, perchance the dead heart might come alive. 
And then with that heart, you'll be able to understand what otherwise you did not. أَوْ آذَانٌ يَسْمَعُونَ بِهَا And with those ears, you'll be able to hear what otherwise you could not hear. فَإِنَّهَا لَا تَعْمَلْ أَبْصَارٌ Truly, it's not these eyes that are lying. No. وَلَكِنْ تَعْمَلْ قُلُوبُ الَّتِي فِي الصُّدُورِ What is blind is the heart which is inside the chest. And so now we know that the heart can see when there is faith in it. This is epistemology, the branch of knowledge which studies knowledge. And it is only after he answered that Ihsan is that you should worship Allah as though you are seeing Him yani, with your heart. Only then will we introduce the questions four and five, which is the end time. <coughs> when will the last hour come? He says, the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge than the one who is questioning. He didn't say, I didn't know. He said, the one who is being questioned has no more knowledge than the one who is questioning. What are the signs of the last day? The alama to sa'a. And then he replied, gave us two. The first one, very easy. You got to be blind not to see it. That the naked barefooted shepherds will be competing with each other in the construction of tall buildings. Have you been to Malaysia recently, anybody? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and uh, those who <coughs> divert such enormous resources to the construction of spectacular high-rise buildings are a people who measure progress by the height of a building. And the Prophet is saying of them, some of them get angry when this is a talk, eh? <laughs> You have the intellectual acumen of naked, barefooted shepherds. Hmm? We are in the end times now. And so this is the time when, as never before, we need al ihsan It is not just a question of moral growth. Of course, you can never reach al ihsan without moral growth. Faith will not enter into the heart until the heart is turned to Allah. But it's not always like that. Like the fellow in New York, did I tell you about him? I don't think he was Brooklyn, maybe it was Harlem. He says, Lord, I live for you. I'll die for you. Everything I'll give up for you, but not my green card. <laughs> it's not my green card. Well, there are many others like him. I can't do that because my business will collapse. I can't do it because I won't get a U.S. visa. I can't do it because they're going to put my name on the no-fly list. I can't do it because if I do it, all the funding for my Islamic organization will triumph. They need to have something called hustle a bath to wash that shirk because with the lips you are saying Allah but with the heart you are saying something else it is when the heart is turned to Allah when you live for Allah and as the class mentioned with the ten you prepare to die for Allah now alhamdulillah <laughs> Now you are standing up. When that happens then, we know 
that these eyes cannot see without light. When electricity goes, you've got to feel for the box of matches, don't you? Similarly, this internal eye cannot see without light. And the Prophet said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, in a hadith recorded in the Sunnah of Imam Tirmidhi, Ittaku firasat al mu'min, fear the firasa of the mu'min, the one who has faith. Firasa being more than simply wisdom, wisdom that comes from internal intuitive spiritual insight, basira. Fear the firasa of the mu'min, for inna hu yanzuru bi nurillah, because when he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. How do we get that nur? Because without that, we, we won't be al-ihsan, and without al-ihsan, we cannot handle the subject of the end time, that we are now living in the end time. Very quickly, it's a Surah to Nur, Surah number 24, Ayah number 35. <coughs> and you are familiar with the Ayah, so we don't have to spend the time on it. That Allah is the Nur of the heavens and the earth, and that which will make you understand the subject is a Mishkan, hollow space. And the Prophet said, Fi Qalbil Mu'min, a hollow space of the heart of the believer. And in that hollow space there is a lamp, and the lamp has a glass, and the glass is, the glass is glittering, it is so sparklessly clean. And so question number one, how do we get Noor? But first of all, the truth must enter into the heart, and when the truth enters into the heart, there is a process of purification, until the glass is clean, and then you've got to polish it with zikr. What is the best zikr of all? What is the zikr, the definite article before it? It's the Quran. Inna nahnu nazzalna zikr. And so the recitation of the Quran, the constant recitation of the Quran, the recitation of the Quran with tears in your eyes, the recitation of the Qur'an with tears in your heart. That is the polish. You don't need to go looking for any more. And you're not reciting the Qur'an unless you're reciting it in accordance with the Sunnah. And the Sunnah is cover to cover. Am I right? Is that the Sunnah? You know the story about the woman who was married and Husband had no time to even touch her. And so she went and she complained. She had the right to do so. So the Prophet called the man. Find out why he didn't have time to even touch his wife. And then, then he said to him, okay, recite the Quran, meaning cover to cover once a month. The man said, oh, messenger of Allah, but I couldn't do better than that. He says, all right, once a week, but no faster than that. You must have some time for your wife. So we know that reciting the Quran cover to cover at least once a month. At least once a month. Is what the Prophet asked for. If you can do better than that, you do better than that. Hmm? So he divided the Quran into seven parts. You know that. Because there are how many days in the week? Seven, seven days. Even Pope Gregory can't change that. <laughs> so you recite the whole Quran once a week. But you know how life is busy today. Everybody busy. Morning traffic, evening traffic and so on. So most of us are as lazy as Imran Hussein. So we recite it once a month. You know, you're doing that, aren't you? Come on, shake your heads. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not doing that, well, st start now. Cover to cover. The first time, yes, I know, if you're not an Arab, the first time it might take about five, six months. Don't be worried. 
Never mind. The second time, you take less time. And then the third and the fourth and the fifth and then you become familiar with the word. You won't be stumbling over them. And then the time will come when, when the whole day passes. From the time you walk in the morning until the time you sleep at night. And you never, never recited the Quran. You're going to go to sleep with pain in your heart. Hmm? This is called zikr. This polishes the heart. But you need more than that for noor. You need some oil in the lamp. Not any oil will work for the, the last age. No, you need the best oil. And which is the best one? Zaytun, the olive oil. And this is an olive oil tree that leans neither to the east or to the west. It stands for only for Allah. And the oil of this tree is so pure. Why? Because he lives for Allah. He'll die for Allah. His Allah. So he produces the best oil of all. That it, it's glowing already even though fire has not as yet touched it. So when that noor enters into the heart, the flame is lit. Then anything he does is transformed into noor. Noorun ala noor. Yes, I know there are many more sophisticated ways of explaining that I am. This is the most elementary, but this is the most important for us here. But how does the verse end? Wallahu bi kulli shayin. Ali. Wallahu bi kulli shayin. Alim, Ill knowledge. The ayah is sending a message that the purpose of the acquisition of Noor is not for performing somersaults on the cloud. <coughs> that would be spectacular. Hold us. Keep Tom will stop to look at you. He's sum somersaulting on a cloud. Oh, but I saw him in the Hajj, he was going around the Kaaba. And you say he was here in Cape Town all through the time of the Hajj. Great feet, eh? Two places at the same time and so on. That is not the supreme function of no when it enters the heart. Rather, the supreme function is located in this search for knowledge. So that when you have Noor, you can now see what otherwise you could not see. There's nothing mysterious about this subject, isn't it? Any one of you can teach this subject now. We have not trespassed beyond any barrier of the Quran or the Sunnah. We are planted firmly in the Quran and the Sunnah. And we have presented to you Islamic spirituality. And when it enters into the heart, and you can now see, it taku firasat al mu'min. Fa innahu yanzaru bi nurillah fear. The firasa, the mu'min. But when he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. Anybody could see the tall building. Even the former Prime Minister of Malaysia. <laughs> but then he spoke about a slave woman giving birth to her mistress. And that one isn't easy. No. In order for us to penetrate this sign of the last day, of a slave woman giving birth to the mistress, all buildings are here, I'm already here. We need to go beyond the text that we had, that we studied in the classroom of Fiqh. We need to be able to study the modern economy and then be able to apply the Quran and the Hadith to the understanding of the modern economy. And we need to do the same thing with the world of women. When we do that, 
we will then realize that that woman is a slave woman because of an attack launched by someone named the Jazz. I don't know whether you ever met this gentleman. Al Masih Dajjal, the Jal, the false Messiah. In whose time, said the Prophet, there will be Kathrat al Riba. How much riba? So much. I mean, this must have terrified the early Muslims when they heard it. That the time will come when you will not find a single person, not one, in all of mankind who will not be consuming riba. Not one who will not be consuming riba. And whoever claims that he is not consuming riba, verily the dust of riba would be on him. Verily the vapor of riba would reach him. They must have been terrified when they heard that. We will, inshallah, during this retreat, attempt to address that subject of riba. But tonight we simply say to you that it's because of riba that she is a slave woman. She's traveling on the ship, and all of mankind are on board that ship. But most of mankind are traveling in the whole of the ship as slaves. But there are those who have first class tickets. And they have permanent first class tickets on board that ship. And I didn't give this analogy. I am not the first to give this analogy of the world today, the economy. Fidel Castro gave it. <laughs> yes, Fidel Castro gave it. They're traveling on board the ship, permanent first class tickets. They have bottled water, mineral water to drink. But down there she has to drink the filthy water, contaminated water, muddy water. These ones are eating organic food, the most expensive, huh? And those down there have the GM. <laughs> and you know the GM comes with a price. It's not just that when you eat the GM, the genetically modified food, you're attempting to do a better job than the great engineer who engineered the food and who gave it its genetic composition so that the food could function not only nutrition, nutritionally, nutritionally, but that the food can also function medicinally, medicinally. Huh? Medicine, for example, to sustain the immune system. You don't have to go to the soup, to the pharmacy every week to buy food for the immune system. No, it comes from the food that you eat. So when they tamper with the genetic composition of the food, now you get a bigger crop and the farmer goes to get more <coughs> money. So who's going to bother about organic farming when this one gives you more money? Bigger crop. But in the process of eating this food, the immune system grows weaker and weaker. That has already happened. So you have to get more and more something called, you ever heard of it, antibiotics? <laughs> so she's a slave woman. And she's a slave woman because of an attack launched by Dajjal. She's not in, entered into slavery only because of money being lent on interest, but also because of... Oh, I didn't bring it, huh? Anybody has a South African run here you can lend me? <coughs> I'm talking with a paper, eh? <laughs> not a gold coin. Yeah. I don't know whether you will have 
I've ever seen this. It's a piece of paper. And you put a you put a picture. Picture on it. Ah uh, here we are. I don't know whether you've ever seen this. You take a piece of paper and you put a picture on it. And you put a number on it. <coughs> and then you assign to it an entirely fictitious value. An entirely fictitious value. But before you use that word, fictitious value, you better go and do your homework first. You have to study international monetary economics before you make this statement, which I have done, alhamdulillah. So you take a piece of paper, you put a picture, you put a number. You say, abracadabra. <laughs> <laughs> Some mysteriously, it, it acquires a, a fictitious value. I with one piece of paper, you can buy <coughs> chicken, <laughs> and with another piece of paper, you can buy a BMW. <laughs> I don't think the Ummah Muhammad would ever be deceived into accepting this as paper, certainly not the scholars of Islam. I don't think that that day would ever come with you. Do you? Will we ever descend to such a depth of blindness that we will accept? Huh? So she's a slave woman, and this is one of the reasons. All that they have to do is to keep on printing. <laughs> Buy machines and keep on printing. And those donkeys out there will keep on asking for the paper. <laughs> yeah. And they also start to print, you know, their paper. But those donkeys, they don't understand when they take a basket full of their paper to Manhattan, they can't even buy a cup of coffee. Because it's not hard currency. No. We have a certain chemical, we just dip it in the chemical, it becomes hard currency. <laughs> and they don't have it, so there's a not hard currency. Huh? It's fun, isn't it? Except on Judgment Day, when we have to answer for it. But not only is she a slave woman, but in addition to that, she gives birth to a baby. If it's a baby boy, no problem. The baby boy will not rule over her. Why? The baby boy will not rule over her. And tali dal amatu rabbataha. The baby boy will not rule over her, but the baby girl will rule over her. A woman going to rule the world one day? Will this ever happen? How can women rule the world when Allah says in the Quran, that men have qawwam in relation to women, <coughs> meaning not only maintaining, but also guarding and protecting. And so they have a daraja. That Daraja or that status does not give them superiority in the sight of Allah because the Prophet said that all of mankind will stand before Allah on judgment day as equal as the teeth of a comb. This also includes the Malaysian monarchy. <laughs> so if you are a man, you don't stand before Allah taller than a woman. No. And if you're a woman, you do not stand before Allah taller than a man. You all stand before him as equal in his sight as are the teeth of a comb. Said Muhammad But a woman has an obligation to be obedient to her guardian.
the time will come when the world of women is going to be turned upside down to such an extent that the sun will rise from the west. They're going to be dressed and yet naked. They are the last people to go out to Dajjal, said the Prophet And a man will have to return to his home and tie down his wife and sister and daughter to save them from being deceived by Dajjal. So Dajjal attacks the world of women with an attack which will brainwash them so utterly and so thoroughly you can talk from now until judgment day you will not be able to impress your daughter it will be like water falling off the back of a duck so you'll have to tie her down mean coercively restrain to save her from the job what is this attack that he's going to launch on women? You know Allah created the male and female the way he created the night and day. He said that in Surah Al-Layl, didn't he? وَلَيْلِ إِذَا جَرُشَا He took an oath by the night and the, by that it which it shrouds so mysteriously and he took an oath by the day and it's resplendent light, everything bright, nothing covered, nothing concealed, nothing mysterious about a man. <coughs> All the mysteries with women, nothing mysterious about a man. That in the same way that he created the night and the day, so too did he create the male and the female. There it is. وَلَيْلِ إِذَا يَغْشَى وَالنَّهَارِ إِذَا تَجَلَّى وَمَا خَلَقَ الذَّكَرَ وَالْأُنْثَى And now comes the fourth verse, which is already there, plain and simple. Even if the fourth verse did not come, we'd already understood that you are functionally different. إِنَّ سَعَيَكُمْ لَشَتَّى You are functionally different. That Allah created the male and gave to the male certain functions. And he created the, the female and he gave her a biological constitution. And he gave her a <coughs> physiological constitution because she is functionally different. But the Dajjal comes along and attempts to take the night and make her day. <laughs> So he said that women will be dressed like men. Have you seen her? With the jacket? And with the trousers? <coughs> and with the tie? Have you seen her? 1400 years ago he said that this would happen. She is dressed like a man because she is now seeking to assume the functional role of men in society. And anything a man does, a woman should have the freedom to do it. But in the process, she is either compromising or neglecting or abandoning her functional role that Allah gave to her when Allah created her from a drop of sperm. So eventually, you know, I don't know whether you know about a woman who was in Mr. Clinton's cabinet. <laughs> I didn't see, I couldn't tell she was a woman by looking at the face. It was the face of a man. I hope she never listens to this lecture. <laughs> the face changes. The face becomes masculine. The voice changes. The voice becomes masculine. Hmm? The behavior changes. You remember out there in the desert, Sinai, not the hospital in Manhattan, when Musa al Islam had brought the water up, gave to the sheep, he's tired now, he goes to take some shade under a tree, Lord help me, I need some help. And then the girl comes back, my father, wants to thank you 
for what you did. He wants you to come and have a meal. But Allah describes how she approaches him. She's bashful. She's shy. Uncle Sam's daughters ain't like that anymore. <laughs> and after the Jal has destroyed her femininity, he also destroys her fertility. She can't have babies. So now she's got to go to the clinic, the fertility clinic. And this guy comes along, this Dajjal, and tells her after all of that, he tells her, you come a long way, baby. Imagine that. <coughs> so now she has to go to the woman down in the hall of the ship, so that her womb will become a factory. And she's paid for her services. And when the baby is born, of course, during the nine months, make sure you drink bottled water, <laughs> mineral water. And don't eat that stuff, eat organic food and so on, because that's a first-class baby inside there, you know. And then the baby is born and the baby goes first-class, and mama remains in the hole of the ship. It's already here. It's already here. This surrogate parenting is already here. Why pay $70,000 in the United States when you can go to Bangladesh and get it for $7,000? You can go to India and get it for $7,000. Huh? So you have to open your eyes and see. You have to take a little time to see. And when you look, you must look with noor from Allah. And then you'll see the slave woman giving birth to her mistress. And so there is a spiritual requirement for the study of the modern world and in that spiritual requirement there is an epistemological requirement. The Prophet said every Prophet has warned his people about the Dajjal and the Prophet Noah warned his people about the Dajjal but I am going to tell you something no one ever said before me. The Jal sees with his left eye. He's blind in the right eye. It looks like a bulging grape. Between his eyes on his forehead is written the word kafir. And every mu'min will be able to read it. Whether the mu'min is katib or khayr or katib. Literate or illiterate. The Jal is going to travel on a donkey. The donkey will travel, because you're going to ride on a donkey, the donkey will travel as fast as the clouds. The donkey will have his ears stretched out wide. The child is going to step into the water and into the ocean and the water will reach him up to his knee. The child is going to be jumping between the heavens and the earth, not the heavens, the samawat, the skies and the earth. The earth will deliver its treasures to Dajjal. In this, street, in this retreat you will learn that that moment when Dajjal will appear in human form in Jerusalem and declare, I am the Messiah. And then rub his hands and say, mission accomplished. It's not too far from now. This child should live to see it. But on that day when Dajjal stands up in Jerusalem and declares, I am the Messiah, what are you going to do when he has two eyes? Are you going to say, no, you can't be Dajjal? <laughs> because the prophet said you have one eye, so why don't you have one eye? Huh? And what are you going to do when he says that he is the Messiah, but he doesn't have a flying donkey? You're going to ask him, where is your flying donkey? <laughs> and what are you going to do when if he steps into the ocean, he goes and sinks him down right down? Huh? If he steps into the ocean, he goes down. 
Come jump, let me see how, how high you can jump. And he jumps and he can only jump two feet. But the Prophet said that you'll be jumping between the heavens and the earth. We have an epistemological challenge here. If you insist that there is nothing symbolic in Islam, in the Quran and the Sunnah, requiring interpretation that has not been interpreted by Allah and His Messenger. Nothing. Everything which had to be interpreted has already been interpreted. On that day, you'll have to say to him, you are not the job. Well, in fact, he will be the job. But on that day, we who use a different epistemology, taught to us by Surah al -Kahf. In the passage between the encounter between Musa and Khidr alayhi salam. We would know that knowledge comes not only externally but also internally. And there are some subjects which are covered, mastur. And Allah at the proper time would raise the cover. And we will then have to interpret. How would they know 1400 years ago that all these people here use the flying donkey to get here? They all came by flying donkey. <coughs> this is our interpretation that the flying donkey is a modern aircraft. But since it is our interpretation, you don't have to accept it. You could sit down and wait for the flying donkey and we're not seeking to embarrass you. No. This is our interpretation. If we are right, good for us. If you are right, then keep sitting on the, on the, on the sofa waiting. Knowledge comes not only from external sources, but also internally. On three occasions, Musa alayhi salam used externally derived knowledge. The boat, the boy, the wall. <coughs> and on three occasions, his answer was wrong. And Khidr alayhi salam wa allamnahu min ladunna ilma who gets knowledge not only externally but also internally. He gives the correct explanation of all three. So we say that the Jal sees with the left eye symbolizes external sign, the scientific method. And the Jal is blind in the right eye it symbolizes internal blindness. And uh, Ambassador Alan Rose spoke this morning and will be speaking again. This is what the secularization of education and knowledge does. It reduces <coughs> it to one eye. In fact, if you could see two eyes, you're not going to succeed as a politician. You'll be fired as a minister. I can see with two hands. And on his forehead is written the word kafir. The reason why Ali radiallahu ta'ala who could read it, but Abu Jahl cannot, is not because there's something defective with Abu Jahl's eyes, because Ali radiallahu ta'ala who is seeing with the internal eye. And when the Jal steps into the ocean and the water reaches in up to the knee, we say, oh, that's already happening. He has already created the technology with which to be able to reach down to the bottom of the ocean and pick up things as though the water is reaching him to his knee. 
And when he said that the Dajjal will be jumping between the heavens and the earth, he said that's already happening. He has already advanced that technology with which to be able to, so to say, jump between the heavens and the earth. This is a tremendous debate in the world of Islam today. This is our view on this side. And our view is gaining momentum day by day because it makes sense. It explains the world. And there is the other view which we must also respect because they are our brothers and they are learning men. Who refuse, absolutely refuse to explain any of these things symbolically. No. Only Allah and His Messenger can explain. And when the Messenger of Allah has died, no one has the authority to interpret anything symbolically. And so we end, it's now 8.30, with this introduction. There will be no questions tonight. There's no need for any questions tonight. With this introduction to the link between Islamic spirituality, which is al ihsan which is to be able to see what otherwise cannot be seen, to see with the nur of Allah, and this is firmly planted in the Sunnah and in the Hadith. It taku firasad al mu'min fa innahu yanzuru bi nurillah. Fear the firasad of the mu'min because when he sees, he sees with the nur of Allah. The link between Islamic spirituality or al ihsan and the end times which Allah conveyed to us in this dramatic event in which he sent Jibra'il al-Islam to teach us a lesson which will remain forever unforgettable. <coughs> so we pray that we'll never forget it. Rabbana taqabbal minna inna ka anta sabmin alim wa tabarina ya mawlana inna ka anta tawab rahim. Bi rahmatika ya